Podcasts are supported by Pepperdine's Graduate School of Education and Psychology, offering a master's in clinical psychology with an MFT evening format. Priority deadline to apply for September classes is July 8th. gsep.pepperdine.edu. From the Moan Broadcast Center, this is Take Two. May Martinez. Gavin Newsom wants 3.5 million new homes built in California over the next decade. Local governments are countering with building a fraction of that. We'll hear which side is more likely to get their way. Plus, eateries pop up in downtown LA all the time. But for one chef, that wasn't enough. Opening a restaurant in a neighborhood that you didn't know and weren't part of, I, I didn't think was very responsible. So we moved in right next door. It's a head-on take two. Stay with us. Podcasts supported by Spectrum News One. Host Alex Cohen provides a deeper look at the issues affecting Southern Californians and their communities on Inside the Issues. Weeknights at 8 on Spectrum News One on Channel One. Exclusively on Spectrum. From 89.3 KPCC, this is Take Two. I'm Amy Martinez. And in case you missed it, it just wrapped up in France. The United States beats Sweden 2-0 to uh, win Group F at the Women's World Cup. Up next, Monday versus Spain. All right, now to the show. L.A. still reeling from last week's news that homelessness in the city is increasing despite a massive infusion of millions of voter-approved dollars. So we're going to be looking at the housing crisis from a variety of angles today, why there isn't enough of the affordable stuff, whether single family homes are a thing of the past and how to provide sanitation services in the tent cities that many people without a roof over their heads use as shelter. We'll be getting into all that, so stay with us. But we start with housing affordability. Now, pretty much everyone agrees there isn't enough of it in California. There just isn't a lot of agreement about why that is or how to solve the problem. Some housing experts say it's a lack of supply. There's just not enough housing to go around, so prices go up as people compete for the few good homes out there. The solution, then, could be to fast-track the building of more homes throughout the state. Well, that's what Governor Gavin Newsom has called for, but it's not so simple. Regional lawmakers are pushing back on whether that should happen, and if so, where. Liam Dillon has covered this for the Los Angeles Times. He's with us now. Welcome. Thank you. All right, let's establish the players first. Uh, There's Governor Gavin Newsom. He made a campaign pledge before his election about home building. What did he say and why? So he has said the state should build uh, three and a half million homes between now and 2025. An amount would be be 500,000 homes a year. Uh, To give listeners some context, that would be more than quadrupling uh, sort of the number uh, of average homes that is built in the state in recent years. And the point, uh, as he said, look, at the the, the main reason why California uh, housing problems have gotten so much worse and things are so unaffordable for people of not just, you know, low income, but middle income and even some high income folks is that uh, there just simply aren't enough homes. And so if you build that amount of housing that, that will add new supply that will uh, either stabilize or decrease, you know, how much it costs to live here. All right. Now, to build those three and a half million new homes, uh, he needs uh, local governments to buy in. And so that's the second player in this uh, drama. Uh, down here, some are represented by this organization called the Southern California Association of Governments, or SCAG. Remind us uh, who SCAG is. It's a sort of regional agency that's made up of uh, local governments in the six-county region in Southern California, really everywhere in Southern California except for San Diego. And it's huge. I mean, it represents 19 million people, right, and you know, roughly half the state. And so they're a huge player in determining how much land at the local level is zoned for housing or how much uh, you know, housing units the entire region wants to permit. So this SCAG group just made a a pretty bold move that put a major dent in the governor's uh, campaign promise. What did it do and why? SCAG put forward a number, and this this is non-binding, but I think it sort of speaks to the divide between local governments and the state, of roughly 430,000 homes over an eight-year period leading through 2029. And if that number were to hold that suggestion, then it would you know, effectively eliminate or make the governor's housing pledge impossible to achieve. And just to be clear, 430,000 homes by 2029, originally the number was a little bit bigger, but then they kept scaling the number down even further. At this point, it's less about the, the number and more about the attitude. 
right? I mean, you have states saying we need a huge amount of housing growth and you local governments need to permit a lot more housing to deal with our, our housing problem. And local governments saying, well, wait a second, you know, we it's very important for us to control the character of our, of our communities where growth goes and how much growth there is. And so a very clear divide, I think, between a number of um, uh, you know, local governments, particularly in Southern California now with this action, and what the governor and other state uh, officials may want to see. And that attitude you mentioned, that's not a new thing. Uh, just to remind listeners, local governments have really had a history of fighting state measures, uh, just like the, uh, the bill SB50, which is uh, tabled for the rest of, the, of this year, at least. That would have allowed denser buildings on your transit and job center. So really, Liam, their gripes with Sacramento have been growing for a long time. Yeah, and I think it's coming to a head as this housing crisis gets worse and worse, right? Not just housing, but homelessness, too. You know, the state says we need to build more. Local governments say we need to continue to have control over the way our cities look. And that is sort of a fundamental divide, I think, philosophically over this issue. And so they're going to keep being at loggerheads while this problem gets worse. Talking to Liam Dillon, he covers California state politics and policy for the Los Angeles Times. You mentioned local control and character of neighborhoods. Is that what local lawmakers are worried about the most here? Yeah, I think it's that. I also think, you know, when talking to them, they say, look, like if the state says that we have to zone this much amount uh, for housing or tell us exactly where the housing is supposed to go. So you mentioned Senate Bill 50. One of the big ticket things in that was, you know, allowing fourplexes, duplexes, triplexes in uh, neighborhoods that are now only for single family homes. Right. And I think what a lot of those communities are, uh, their perspective is, look, like we know where development should go in our communities. Maybe there's a rundown mall. We know that the housing should go here. Right. Not necessarily in single family neighborhoods. And they're worried about the state coming in and saying, well, actually, it should be going here without t- kind of taking those local contexts into account. All right. So we got that tension between the state and the local lawmakers. Does one have more leverage than the other? I mean, can the governor force the hands of localities or, or- Can localities rebel enough for the governor to maybe back down? So when it comes to this particular state law, the governor has pretty wide latitude to say, you region need to plan for a rather large number of new homes. But after that point, it's really in the local government and regional government's hands to figure out exactly how that would work. So even divvying up that lesser large number or any number of housing that would need to be zoned for, that's in the control of local government. And so they could push it, say, more to certain communities, not to others. And also when it comes, frankly, to actually approving the buildings and going beyond zoning and planning and kind of getting sticks in the ground, that's almost entirely under the control of the cities and counties. The penalties, though, aren't there, right? I mean, uh, they just don't seem to have a lot of teeth if uh, local communities don't want to abide by the law. You're right. They don't have a ton of teeth. And also there are a lot of developers who are concerned if they're going to, say, take a city to court for violating state law and denying their project potentially. That could lead to two problems for them. One, court processes are generally drawn out and long anyway. Right. Number one. And number two, that could poison the well for any future project they might want to do in a community. You're not going to win the favor of a city's mayor if you decide to sue that mayor a year ago. So what steps are being taken by state lawmakers that maybe would give them more leverage over certain communities? At this point, these proposals seem to be dying on the vine in Sacramento. You mentioned the the SB50 that was tabled, so that's gone. So at least when it comes to what's going on right now, the the local government perspective is winning even at the Capitol. Liam, what are you watching for uh, next uh, over how this plays out? Because while they fight over building, this housing crisis is probably just going to get worse. Later this summer, the state's going to come out with its official number and the region SCAG will have to deal with that. Right. So that's a practical thing that's going to be happening. But, you know, again, as far as some of these larger scale things, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, we, we were just seeing the final stretches of the budget being passed here in Sacramento, where there's going to be a significant amount more money than at least compared to recent memory for housing and homelessness, but still a lot to be determined as far as these sort of sticks as opposed to the carriage of the money that's out there for what penalties may be for local governments that may not be zoning or approving enough development. Liam Dillon covers California state politics and policy for the L.A. Times. Liam, thanks a lot. Thanks so much. Now, in the midst of these California battles over housing, one skirmish is over the fate of single-family homes. 
It's the American dream to have that nice house with a lawn, but the future of a place like L.A. might be more duplexes, condominiums, even apartment buildings. That's because without a lot of free land to build on, places like Los Angeles have no choice but to build up. Only recently have cities started facing the reality that if they want to deal with the housing crisis, then single-family homes might be a thing of the past. New York Times reporter Emily Badger has that story. She's with us now. Emily, welcome. Thanks for having me. All right. Let's start with how single-family homes became the way for urban planners to design a city. What's the short history there? So this is what cities have been doing for nearly 100 years. This concept of single-family zoning, which says, you know, not just that we're going to build single-family homes, but we're going to build neighborhoods of single-family homes, and we're not going to allow anything in them other than single-family homes. This is something that cities have been doing, uh, you know, at least since the 1920s. And it really has become sort of the, the default way that new suburbs are built. It's become the ideal that older cities have sort of downzoned their way into over time. And we've reached this point in the United States States today where many major cities, uh, lots and lots of suburbs, are saying that, you know, on three quarters or even more of all of the residential land in their city, you are not allowed to build anything other than a single family home. And Emily, it almost became like a promise of the West, right? Especially in the United States uh, a few decades ago, you move West, you got all kinds of rooms to and, and space to do whatever you want. Yeah, I mean, I think there's this very sort of American idea built into single-family zoning, which is that, you know, everyone should aspire to own a home and that that home should be a detached single-family home on its own parcel with a yard with a fence around it. You know, that other forms of living, apartment buildings, duplexes, you know, those are for renters, those are for people who have not yet, you know, made enough money to buy their own home. You know, there's some sort of kind of lesser, uh, even morally inferior form of housing uh, and that really, you know, what we should all be aspiring to is this one particular thing. Yeah, housing density kind of became a boogeyman in, in some ways. Now, in your recent article on this, uh, you wrote, quote, single family zoning is practically gospel in America. But uh, Emily, now that kind of zoning has been hitting a sour note with lawmakers. Can you give us an example of where and why? Sure. So in December, the city of Minneapolis did this really radical thing. They are the largest city in the country to have ever said, you know, single family zoning takes up an enormous amount of our city and we're just going to get rid of it. You know, we're going to say overnight um, on all of these single family parcels, you can build two units, you can build three units. We're just going to get rid of the, the idea of single family zoning entirely. So Minneapolis did this thing that seemed really crazy at the time. And then a bunch of other cities started calling Minneapolis and saying, how did you do this? How did you convince your voters that this would be a good idea? And, you know, then so we're starting to see these conversations in other cities. We're obviously seeing this conversation at the state level showing up in things like SB 50 in California, or even just today, the state house in Oregon passed a bill that would effectively end single family zoning in most of the state of Oregon. Talking to New York Times reporter Emily Badger, uh, the shift, though, it it hasn't been embraced by people who live in single family homes. What's the uh, resistance there? Well, the the resistance comes in a bunch of different forms. Um, you know, some of it takes the form of these very kind of practical concerns about uh, where am I going to park my car? Uh, what if my child's classroom becomes overcrowded? You know, can the sewer system underneath my neighborhood handle two or three times as many people living in the neighborhood as currently do? So there, there's one set of objections that are very, you know, kind of visceral quality of life objections and fears that people have. And then, you know, there are other more sort of abstract objections that have to do with, you know, the character of my neighborhood, my sense of local control over my neighborhood, fears about whether or not this will harm my property value, uh, just fears in general about change. You know, what will the what will the unknown do to my quality of life and to my property value? And what will it do to the fact that I have basically, you know, sunk a vast amount of my life savings into purchasing a property and I'm counting on that property value holding? And isn't there also a concern that uh, the only people, the only people who win with housing density are the developers? Yeah, I mean, this is an argument that I find recurs absolutely everywhere in the country that is having this debate. 
um, you know, there, there's this very prominent notion that all of this is being driven by developer interests, that, you know, critics in Minneapolis who are very upset with the city's decision feel that Minneapolis is just giving itself away to developers. Um, you know, when we wrote about this in the New York Times, I heard from readers who asked, you know, why are we sort of, um, you know, giving voice to the agenda of developers? Um, but I think that that's really sort of oversimplifying the situation. There, there are, in fact, you know, a affordable housing groups and there are, you know, younger millennial renters and there are social justice groups and there are environmentalists who are all advocating for this idea. It's it's a much more um, sort of interesting and motley group of people than just greedy developers. One last thing, Emily, really quick. If Americans were to embrace more dense housing, how hard would it be to re-envision, uh, say, the, the so-called American dream? What, what do those people pushing for dense development say is just as good as that? Well, I don't think what this would look like at the end of the day or what it's going to look like in Minneapolis is that all of a sudden these single family neighborhoods are going to be full of, you know, five to 10 story apartment buildings. What it's probably going to look like is that slowly over time, you know, one parcel on a block will turn over. Maybe it'll have a two or three unit building on it over time. You know, maybe there will be a couple of modest size apartment buildings. Um, You know, these changes, I think, will be more gradual than people are thinking. And if you have a single family home and you want to keep it, you will still be able to do that. Emily Badger, New York Times reporter. Emily, thanks a lot. Thanks. This week, L.A. Mayor Eric Garcetti announced an overhaul of the city's approach of cleaning up streets. Sanitation department teams will work alongside homeless folks to keep encampments as tidy as possible. Some might be able to bring out some mobile hygiene centers as well. Now, while some are happy over the move, others worry this could make the camps feel more permanent. Coming up, we're going to hear from three different community stakeholders on this when Take Two continues in 60 seconds. Stay with us. Back now with more Take Two on 89.3 KPCC. I'm A. Martinez. Now, we've all noticed the streets of L.A. have gotten a lot dirtier in the last few years with excess trash concentrated, especially in areas like downtown and near freeway overpasses. The increase in people sleeping on those streets is one reason for it. And as you well know by now, the city does have a plan to try and make it better. Here's Mayor Eric Garcetti talking on Wednesday about what the sanitation department is going to do. We're going to boost the number of sanitation teams on our streets by 50%, from 20 to 30, and invest over $6 million of additional funds in our sanitation crews with better equipment, extra supplies. The plan also includes putting extra bathrooms and trash bins for those who live in and near tent encampments. Now, it's a start, but we wanted to get some reaction to the plan. So today, we're going to hear from three stakeholders. Pete White is founder and executive director of the Los Angeles Community Action Network. Hi, Pete. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for having me. Ellen Riado is executive director of the South Park Business Improvement District in downtown L.A. Ellen, welcome. Thanks so much. We also have Jay Handel, co-chair of the Neighborhood Council Budget Advocates, a city Wide Citizen Oversight Committee. Jay, welcome to you as well. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's start with you, Pete. Uh, since your group has been rallying for a plan to address uh, homelessness for a while, you were at the hearing on Tuesday where the Sanitation Department laid this out. Do you consider this plan, the one they just rolled out, a victory? And so let me be very clear. So this is Pete White with the Services uh, Not Sweeps Coalition in L.A. Can. Um, I don't believe that we can declare victory until we see no more houseless folks living on the streets of Los Angeles. That being said, we do agree with 90 percent of the plan or the proposal that has been set forth by the mayor. We agree with the plan that the mayor has rolled out because we've worked intensely with the mayor's office over the last seven months um, to launch a public health response to encampment living in informal settlements in Los Angeles and not the criminalization, the costly criminalization response that we see. So generally happy with it, 90%. So generally happy with it, um, and I can get into the areas that we're not in a second. Now, Ellen, your region of South Park, uh, which is the area generally around Staples Center, is one of the main neighborhoods uh, heavily affected by homelessness. So what are your thoughts on the proposal? The proposal, frankly, feels a little too little, too late. 
um, you know, our bid and I know the other bids in downtown, we, we, we provide services. We're providing clean and safe services um, for the 52 blocks that we represent in downtown. Um, I'll just throw out some numbers to help provide a little bit of context. Uh, our business improvement district services 200 trash cans in our 52 blocks. Um, that equates to about 45,000 pounds of trash every week that we are removing. And these are bins that are not serviced by any other uh, organization or company, just the business improvement district. Downtown wide, bids are removing about 50 tons of trash every month. And so these numbers, looking at the proposal, um, it doesn't add up. I think, you know, it's an additional $6 million, just over $6 million. And it doesn't um, even come close to, you know, what is really needed for downtown. Jay, uh, the Neighborhood Council Budget Advocates is a volunteer citizens group that engages with neighborhood councils on how the city allocates its budget. Uh, Jay, what's your reaction uh, to uh, to this, to what we saw this week? Well, it was very interesting watching the mayor send out a video saying he takes full responsibility and his plan is to put more sanitation people out there. It, it kind of reminds me of someone that actually just put up a white flag and said, I surrender, I have no plan, we don't know what to do. We spent hundreds of millions of dollars a year in a disjointed effort to criminalize and not house, educate, get mental health for, and get people off the streets. And the fact is we've given plans that could get people off the street in 60 to 90 days that the county supervisors and our city council people have all ignored. Talking to Jay Handel, co-chair of the Neighborhood Council Budget Advocates, also Ellen Riado, executive director of the South Park Business Improvement District in downtown LA, and also Pete White, founder and executive director of the Los Angeles Community Action Network. All right, let's get into the amendments that uh, you want to make to the current plan to improve it. So, Pete, let's start with you mm-hmm. on that. So there's definitely a couple of areas um, on page 18 of the proposal. There's a proposal to have an illegal dumping surveillance team um, placed out there. The the thing I think that listeners need to understand and council members are readily saying is that 80 percent of the problem with uh, illegal dumping is coming from businesses, right? We want to make sure that that surveillance program isn't surveilling houseless people, right? Isn't creating additional barriers or hurdles that they have to get through. Page 17 talks about storage of unattended personal property. That's a nexus to the criminalization that Jay is talking about. In 2017, the city of Los Angeles, Miguel Santana released a report that showed the city of Los Angeles was spending $100 million dollars and homeless services, 87 million of which was going to the police department. And so this unattended um, personal property is a nexus to criminalization. We need to remove anything that looks like criminalization from this. One more. Well, real quick, real quick. Yep. Let, me, let me throw this to Ellen now. Uh, Ellen, when it comes to businesses and what Pete mentioned when it comes to all that dumping, uh, businesses like yours, the ones that uh, you represent, uh, when, when it comes to the, having being painted with that broad brush, what, what do you say to that? Well, I think it's, you know, it's neighborhood to neighborhood. I don't I don't think that 80 percent of our business or, or the trash that we're seeing in our streets, uh, illegally dumped trash is being dumped by the businesses in, in South Park. Um, I do think it varies based on industry, based on location. But what I will say is it certainly affects businesses abilities to operate um, when you have employees that are dependent on transit um, who are trying to get to work in the morning um, and and don't have access to public space, to sidewalks, and are forced to, you know, walk in the middle of the street with oncoming traffic. I mean, that's a public health concern. So, you know, this is not just an issue that affects, uh, you know, our homeless neighbors. Um, this is this is an issue that affects every single person that that should have access to public rights of way. Jay Handel, what about you when it comes to maybe amendments that uh, you'd make to the current plan to improve it? So, what I would really like to see this city do is grow up uh, and go ahead and get. Uh, what New York has, which is a sanitation enforcement group. They have their own sanitation police in New York. They're very strict about dumping. My daughter, who lives in Crown Heights, if she, if her bag is out in front of the house on a non-garbage day, she'll get a ticket. So this will be this will dissuade people from putting things out on the street. In my district in West L.A., there's a lot of these people who do these hauling companies. And all they are is a bunch of gypsy companies with with pickup trucks that are picking up stuff from point A and dropping it on somebody else's street and charging you for the benefit of it. 
So I really believe since we're under policed, you know, with the number of police we have in our city for the the um, number of miles we we enforce, we really should have a sanitation police force and a code that would actually codify what the penalties are and where people have to put their garbage. I was trying to place your accent, Jay, and then you said gar- <laughs> garbage, so then I, I was able to get New York. I, there. I don't sound like Bill Clinton. <laughs> I, do, I do just <laughs> want to add, a, if I can, yeah. one, one additional point here. What we do see is when, when there is trash accumulation on the sidewalks and in alleyways, um, we see it as an invitation for folks to uh, drive to downtown. I mean, we've seen this in our district and elsewhere in downtown. People actually driving to downtown um, and, and adding to that Pile. And so the more we can get on top of, or the faster, I should say, we can get on top of um, removing that trash from the public right away, I think the less we're actually going to see, we're going to stem the flow of uh, oncoming trash. I mean, I would also, I would Go also ahead, add, Jay, uh, Jay, just really quickly. Um, so we're in Skid Row, which is produce central adjacent. And there's so much produce that we see just abandoned on the streets of Skid Row. So all of the refuse that we see coming into the community doesn't necessarily come from from large distances from outside. It's literally it's right our there, neighbors right? are mm-hmm. helping contribute to the amount of refuge on the streets. Now let's get into some of the biggest concerns each of you are hearing from your constituents on this proposal. Pete uh, White, let's start with you on that. So two biggest problems. One, criminalization. The nexus to criminalization is still there. 5611, in the plan on page, I think it's 17, they are um, forecasting that triple the amount of personal property will need to be stored. The only way that you're going to get that property is if you take property away from individuals. The only way you're going to take property away is if you use code 5611. That's one. Mm -hmm. That's the nexus to criminalization. The other thing, and this is hopping on, on something that Jay said, um, also, there's this little line item of $150,000 for the houseless, homeless trash pickup item, um, which would employ houseless people to actually help them with the cleaning up that they already do. That's an aspirational make line them partners item. partners in the whole it thing. It would make yeah. them partners in the whole thing. And $150,000 is a very small amount. But in the plan, um, it's being situated as if we can find the 150000 What we're saying is if you could find $6 million for 47 new uh, city jobs, you definitely have to find at a minimum that one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which not only yeah. employs houseless people, but it also engenders and builds this trust. Ellen, uh, what about you? Uh, concerns that you're hearing from your people? Look, the overall concern here is that we are still attempting to use public right of way um, in ways that it was never designed to be used for. Um, you know, we're we're talking about uh, the the routes by which kids are getting to school. School, folks are getting to work. Um, we are supposed to be able to use this space. Uh, you know, f- it, all members of the public are supposed to be using this space. And so the fact that we are continuing to, uh, you know, jam this round, uh, square peg in a round hole and say, yeah, you know what? Sidewalks can be used for living. I don't care what you do to an underpass. It will never be acceptable or dignified to have human beings living under an underpass. Jay Handel, what about you? Biggest concern right now? Biggest concern is very simple. This is a Band-Aid on a hemophilia. Act. Okay, that's really the bottom line. The city needs to sit down in a, in a cooperative effort with the county, with the state, and quite frankly, with the federal government, who doesn't have a lot of caring for our city at this point, to come up with the money and a plan to get people off the streets ASAP. You know, in West LA, we built a $20 million animal shelter while we walked over bodies on the street. Yikes. It's disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting. So we, we have a leader of our city who is leading a broken, broken city as if he's trying to be the new captain of the Titanic. Well, on that then, on that, uh, one final question for each of you. Will this plan make a difference? Is it better than nothing? Is it better than the status quo, Pete White? And so will this plan make a difference? Yes. Uh, it's a public health plan. We can have a public health approach, which is cheaper than the criminalization approach approach that we see. We need to be mindful that we are in need of 550,000 units of housing across L.A. County at the 30 to 60 percent of median range. Right. We are bleeding because we don't have an economic development program or a real housing policy to house every all Angelinos. Ellen, what about you? Will it make a difference this plan? Look, I I try to be a glass half full kind of person, but when I'm looking at the services that our business improvement district, which 
let me be clear again, only represents 52 blocks of downtown L.A. And I look at this proposal saying we're going to purchase 500 uh, waste bins for 500 Mm. square miles of Los Angeles City. I'm not hopeful. Jay, I got 20 seconds for you. Real quick. You know, to me, it's real simple. I feel like we're flushing the toilet on the street once a week instead of once a month. You know, yes, it, it'll help from a public health point of view, but the reality is, you know, you're not you're not fixing the, the sickness. You're trying to go after a symptom, and and it's misguided. The whole homeless projects are misguided. Jay Handel, Ellen Riotto, Pete White, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you for, for having us. us. Thank you. Love it. New eateries pop up in downtown L.A. all the time, and in many instances, the executive chef lives somewhere else, sometimes nowhere near the place. But for one chef, that wasn't enough. He didn't want to just open a restaurant in downtown, make money, and then drive home to, say, the suburbs. This chef really wanted to get a feel for the area, so he moved in right next door to his new restaurant in the Arts District. Find out all about him when Take Two continues. Stay with us. KPCC podcasts are supported by Pepperdine's Graduate School of Education and Psychology, offering a doctorate of education in organizational leadership, developing graduates with the knowledge and ability to transform organizations for optimal success and growth. An online hybrid tailored for working professionals with attendance only twice per term in West L.A. Attend an information session to learn more. Classes start September. Apply by July 8th for a $1,000 scholarship at gsep.pepperdine.edu. EDU. Podcasts supported by Spectrum News One, where talk meets action, where politicians meet constituents, where issues meet understanding. Join host Alex Cohen for Inside the Issues on Spectrum News One, a nightly political show that takes you inside the issues affecting you, your family, and your community. Inside the Issues, weeknights at 8 on Spectrum News One on Channel One, exclusively on Spectrum. Back now with more Take Two on 89.3 KPCC. I'm e. Martinez. That's the drone of traffic flowing in and out of the L.A. Arts District downtown, including a lot of delivery trucks. The former industrial area is going through a bit of a dining renaissance. Chefs and restaurateurs are flocking there and turning it into something of a culinary hotspot. One of those chefs new to the neighborhood is Lincoln Carson. Carson's known for his pastries, but he's expanding his repertoire with a new eatery and going full on savory. The restaurant is called Bon Tom. And last week I went down to its location at 7th and Santa Fe to check out its bistro style offerings. Chef, thank you, first of all, for having us out here. No, thanks for coming. It's a pleasure. Now, this area of downtown Los Angeles, first of all, why choose to put your spot here? Um, It was really the space. So I I saw the space first. This alley that we're standing in right now really spoke to me because it was empty at the time. There's a large gate that uh, faces the street on Santa Fe that was always locked. And Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, seeing that opened up and seeing how large the alley is, it's faced on either side with these old brick industrial buildings. It's a brick alley. Um, Really reminded me of a European uh, back street. And, you know, typically you'd see four or five cafes in a space like this, you know, very bustling kind of outdoor dining culture and that's one of the things that I was always surprised about LA that there wasn't more of that. All right, so what are we going to go see? So I love to show people this area back behind where our restaurant is and where I live because it's so unexpected. It's like that oasis that I've been talking about with this alley Um, and especially when you're surrounded with all of this old industry and the fact that all of these areas you know used to be train yards and I mean, there's some of the old tracks right here on the back side of this building that they saved and used as uh, decor. My favorite part of this is that most of the foliage around here is all fruit bearing of some, oh, some really? sort or another. Oh. So we've got a couple of olive trees here. In the back, we've got figs, citrus. There's a little garden that we have going in the back oh, wow. as well. I just pulled some lemon verbena the other day. Yeah, right. Oh, right. Mean, right. This, this is, is a little oasis. It's beautiful. Wow, it smells great. Trees everywhere, fountain. Right in the middle, uh, ivy on the brick walls. 
Wow. And a much larger green space as we go further back. Wow. You know, and yet it still has the character and the charm of, right. uh, of wow. what it always was. And I think it's that, it's that kind of dichotomy of this, this old and new that we're trying to capture in the restaurant and the space. It's a good place to come back and take a breath. Read all day long or listen to KPCC, whichever you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Carson's taking on a brasserie style, think unpretentious French fair. One can expect pairs of canapes like tomato tartare for smaller bites. There's also large shareable plates like roasted jidori chicken and a hulking 45-ounce ribeye. The other in-house standout is a sprawling raw bar piled up with scallops, prawns, and Maine lobster. Carson wanted the menu to take inspiration from the building and create harmony between the two. Here's Carson showing us around. I'm with Chef Lincoln Carson inside his new spot called Bon Tom. It's in the L.A. Arts District uh, right off the bat. Sweeping views. How much of the old building did you have to change to fit what you wanted to do in here? Uh, we didn't really change very much. The intent of the restaurant, I think we're trying to be a place that's part of the Arts District. Like My background as a chef is good, working for a lot of French restaurants and some of the best French chefs in the country or the world. I'm not a French chef, but it speaks to everything I do. I think with the restaurant, you know, we're trying to open this um, very fundamentally uh, brasserie-like experience, but we're in downtown L.A. in the Arts District, so we don't want to hide that part of it either. Now, speaking of your experience, uh, pastry chef mm-hmm. is in your emphasis uh, for the most part. Why take this leap? Because we're going to see your savory side now. I've been a pastry chef for 30 years, and for the most part, at the top of the game. But there's always more, right? I've been doing this for for so long that you're always looking for like the next level. What are you going to What are you going to move into? How do you improve? How do you grow? Um, and how do you do something that makes you slightly uncomfortable? Now, when it comes to this place, there's a world around us too that deals with hunger all the time. How important was it for you to make this place as accessible as possible? A hundred percent. You know, the idea of, of the hospitality industry is just that, is hospitality, it's welcoming. It's, you know, the language that we use in a restaurant, you know, a guest in the house, family meal, you know, all of these things speak to entertaining people in your home. And I think sometimes that gets a little bit lost on the business side of it, or maybe on the focus for just doing one aspect of it. If you're a chef, it's just about being in the kitchen and putting food on a plate. And I think you know, it was good for me to come back to what does a restaurant really mean? How can we be part of our community and, and how can we engage with all of the people that live here? And it, it got me out of my comfort zone in terms of dealing with people and, and, and trying to be that friendly face because I didn't get in the back of the house because I'm naturally uh, gregarious and, and <laughs> out there, right? I'm not. Because you, I remember a few years ago, you tried to survive on $4.50 a day. Right? Yeah, I was living in San Francisco yeah. at the time, but girlfriend at the time, now my wife, um, was working for the SF Marin Food Bank. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to bring attention to what people have to go through who are on SNAP benefits and how the food bank can really help them get through every week with, you know, not much money. I mean, the benefits that are are offered are, are pretty minimal. Probably one of the more challenging things I had done. It was pretty amazing. I was cooking for two. Yeah. How did that change you as a chef? trying to survive on that little amount of money to feed yourself throughout the day, and then you make food for a living. It makes you appreciate even more so. Everything needs to be used, like minimize waste. You know, I, I think it's really easy, especially when you're working at a certain level and, and trying to maintain you know, the best and produce the best. It's easy to lose sight sometimes of you know, what it takes for people to to have to get along, to have to make do, you know, and trying to be creative and and how to use the things that would be considered trim and use the things that would be considered, in some cases, garbage and and make something tasty out of it. Lincoln, over the past couple of years, we've spoken to other chefs. Uh, They've all kind of told us that there is this shift, especially in Los Angeles, away from fine dining, white linen cloths. What do you think of that shift, especially in Los Angeles? What does that signal to people about what LA is as a culinary culture? I mean, I think that shift has been happening, not just in L.A., but nationally. But in L.A. especially, I, I don't think it speaks to the quality or the experience. I think it just speaks to the way people are living now. I think the definition of fine dining is changing. But I want you to come in and be comfortable, enjoy yourself. If you came in dressed in a T-shirt and jeans or if you came in in a suit, you should be equally comfortable. I think it, it speaks to just come as however you like. 
you know, and if the restaurant can present itself in such a way that we're professional, that the food is delicious and craveable, that, that the service is what you want it to be, you know, I think that's the important part. Give me a sense, what kind of experience are you looking to create here for someone? You know, much as you've discovered coming here this morning, you know, our district is a little bit slow to wake up in terms of all of the people that live here and work here. Um, I think the restaurant can be that, you know, quiet, gentle place to, to wake up to, have coffee, have patisserie, and then we start to grow the offerings throughout the day. I mean, I wanted to open a place that I would go to, right, like the, at the end of the day. Like, I've worked for a lot of Michelin-starred restaurants. I've worked for a lot of the top places in New York, San Francisco, uh, Las Vegas. It's not what I wanted to open. I wanted to do something that was, I don't want to say every day, but you would want to use it every day in some fashion. There's definitely people that, you know, need a place to go to and have a meeting in the morning or grab a quick lunch, you know, while you're at the office or meet up and bring your parents to dinner when they're in town. Chef Lincoln Carson of the new spot Bon Tom here in the L.A. Arts District. Uh, Chef, thank you very much for uh, having us out here and showing us your new place. No, thanks for being here. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure to show this place off and, and all the people that had some hand in building it and getting it going. All right, last couple of months, I've been able to go out to areas in the Santa Monica Mountains that were scorched by the Woolsey Fire. Now, each visit, I got to see the amazing way that nature heals itself. First time, all I saw was charred trees, dusty, dry hills. The next time, it was so green, almost like the Woolsey Fire never happened. But we all know it did, and restoration efforts are ongoing. Coming up, how helping a certain little hopping critter could go a long way toward the area's complete comeback. Find out how when Take Two continues in 60 seconds. Stay with us. Back now with more Take Two on 89.3 KPCC. I'm A. Martinez. It ain't easy being green. Take the California red-legged frog. Before the Woolsey Fire burnt through the Santa Monica Mountains seven months ago, the frog population was flourishing thanks to a five-year restoration project. But following the fire and then a deluge of rain in the area, the species has been struggling. Katie Delaney is a wildlife ecologist with the National Park Service. She's on the line now to talk about where things currently stand with the species. Katie, welcome to Take Two. Hi, thanks for having me. Sure. All right. Can you give uh, the listeners some more details about the California red-legged frog? What do they look like and what do they contribute to the ecosystem? Oh, sure. So California red-legged frogs are uh, um, the largest native frog in the West. They're California's uh, state amphibian, actually. And um, they're quite large. They're three to five inches long. They are uh, live for about eight to ten years. Uh, it takes them about three years to go from a tadpole to a breeding adult. So the project where, where we start, we start our project with eggs, and so it takes a few years for them to grow up in the streams to become uh, breeding age. Now, before last November's Woolsey Fire, the National Park Service was right in the middle of a five-year restoration project. How was the frog population doing back then? Uh, great. It was The project was going as well as could be expected. Um, we started the project not knowing if frog eggs would hatch in the streams. We started not knowing if tadpoles would turn into froglets or if froglets would grow to breeding age. We definitely didn't know if they would breed on their own, but it turns out that they did all of those things. Um, and they, where we put them they, and monitored them and grew, the, grew them, um, they acted like frogs and they did their <laughs> frog thing and they, uh, they found each other and bred in two of, our stream, two of our reintroduction streams. And so the project was going um, great. Really well. And so when, when all the fire and then the, the, all the rain, what happened to the frog population? So we think that some of the frogs survived the fire. Um, we know they did. We know that some of the frogs survived the fire. They'll, they'll go underground or they'll even, you know, they'll jump in the water, as you'd imagine they would. Yeah. Um, and the fire goes through there pretty quickly. But um, after the, then the rain started right after the fire. And so um, the hillsides kind of come down, you know, with the rain, you get uh, lots and lots of debris. And um, we've all seen um, mudslides and things on the news going through people's um, neighborhoods. But um, in these canyons, basically, we had 
mud and debris just being filling in all of the habitat for the frogs. So we think that we lost frogs during the mudslides, um, but we also lost all the habitat, which is really the the sort of worst part of it. Um, it's hard to know where to yeah. where to sort of start over when the habitat's not recovered yet. And that's kind of the 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 thing here, right? Because you know, some people might say, "Well, okay, frogs, big deal. What how does how does what does that matter in the in the grand scheme of things?" But if the frogs survive and thrive, that means the area is thriving too. Is is that kind of the the reason for the restoration project, a grander reason? Yeah, so a grander reason really. I think of the project as sort of a restoration project the same way that you would restore um an, an area by pulling weeds and planting native plants. You know, we, you you start with that and then you get all the native bugs and then all the frogs and the little things sort of, you know, eat that and thrive and grow. And then they, uh, you know, all the way up to our deer and mountain lions. And so I think of it as a whole, a whole ecosystem sort of restoration to put California red-legged frogs back into those streams here where they were driven to extinction 50 to, you know, 100 years ago. And they're the only native, they're the only native amphibian that's missing from the area. And so mm. our project, sort of for the big picture, is bringing the frogs back, sort of restores the biodiversity of the area that we lost before. That's Katie. It makes it, he brings it intact. That's Katie Delaney, wildlife ecologist with the National Park Service. Katie, thanks a lot for the time. Thank you so much. All right, closing out today's show, California has a long history with religion. We've got more megachurches than any other state. Pentecostalism was born here, and today, one small California city has become an unlikely global epicenter of Christian culture. As part of our California Dream collaboration, KQED's Vanessa Rancaño reports. Redding, California is the kind of place you learn your way around in a day or two. Downtown is just a handful of blocks. But walking around this city of 90,000, you can meet people from a dozen countries in a day. From Australia. From the Netherlands. New Zealand. I'm from England. Manchester. They're not here for the fly fishing or the views of Mount Shasta. No. God is what brought me to Redding, California. Specifically, God brought Golibe Omenaka to the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. You are called to shape history. The flawlessly produced promo video for the school shows people, mostly young, hip-looking people, raising their arms in worship while a band plays on stage. They place their hands on a forehead, a shoulder, a knee. A man hands over his crutches and walks freely. Will you say yes? We are a supernatural school, so we believe that healing is for today. Leslie Crandall oversees first-year students at the School of Supernatural Ministry, where students are taught through prayer they can manifest the power of God to heal. We believe that God is still speaking and, and he can speak to his kids, and he does. The school was founded 21 years ago by a pastor who heads up Bethel Church. It started with a few dozen local students. Today, the school's 2,500 students represent more than 70 countries. It enrolls more international vocational students than any other school in the country. On a Monday morning, 1,200 first years file into class. Anoint our time together in the name of Jesus. Amen. The students are studying worship music. You got homework to you on Wednesday. Yes, indeed. Golibe Omenaka was still in England when he encountered Bethel's teaching at his church in Manchester. At first, he wasn't feeling the whole miracle thing. My internal response was, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of in my life. But then... When you pray for someone, a complete stranger on the streets, and they get healed of a leg injury, and they say, what the heck have you done to me? It kind of changes the way you look at things. Bethel wants to be more than a school with international pull. More than a megachurch with 11,000 members. Richard Flory is a University of Southern California sociologist who studied Bethel and says their objective is nothing short of cultural transformation. Let's get the right kinds of Christians in the right kinds of public sectors of American society, politics, economics, Hollywood, whatever, through their efforts will bring about the kingdom of God on earth in the here and now. But some Reading residents don't want to be part of the experiment. Reading is their test case of turning a city that is a democracy into a theocracy. Laura Hammonds is a member of Investigating Bethel, a Facebook group with more than a thousand members. Hammonds is one of a dozen members of the group meeting at a Reading park one afternoon. 
Another member, Donna Zebel, is passing out stickers. Some say, don't drink the Kool-Aid. We've, we've handed them out, you know, just freely because, you know, we want to get the message out there. Some people are afraid to put them on their car. Afraid, she says, because the church's influence feels like it runs through the core of the city. Redding's mayor is a Bethel elder. Bethel paid the salaries of several police officers when the city couldn't afford to. Bethel's influence was central to getting a direct flight from LAX to Redding. And there's a $150 million Bethel expansion underway that will triple church capacity and allow the school to grow by 1,000 students. They have this really well-organized program to innervate everything with, with their influence. David Boone, another member of Investigating Bethel. You get this feeling that they know they're a sort of virus, but they think they're the good virus that we all need. For some in Reading, the very integrity of their city is at stake. Others see Bethel as a positive force. They say it makes the city more vibrant, diverse. It's good for the economy. Either way, Bethel's outsized influence on this little city is unavoidable. Reading has become a new type of Christian Mecca. In Reading, I'm Vanessa Rancaño. All right, if you missed any part of the show, don't do it next time. We're on at 2 o'clock. Please, 2 o'clock. We need you live. But if you did, just go to wherever you get your podcasts and download the Take Two podcast. You can also find me on Twitter, A. Martinez LA. That's A. Martinez LA. Thanks for listening. Thanks for trusting us with your time. Take Two. We'll be back tomorrow at 2. Talk to you then.